Welcome to Down Ancient Trails, the online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust off long forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. So welcome everyone to another episode of Down Ancient Trails. And we are delighted to have with us here today, Dr. Queen Bala Marak, and with a very, very exciting topic in our Herd and Harvest series. So I would like to hand it over to Dr. Paramita to introduce our speaker. Over to you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we are delighted to welcome the 83rd speaker of our Down Ancient Trails series, Dr. Queen Bala Marak. I will just provide a short introduction of her and then hand over the screen to her. Dr. Marak is an anthropologist who has worked extensively in Northeast Indian issues, more specifically in the areas of prehistoric archaeology, cultural heritage and food. She is a gold medalist and best graduate in BA Anthropology from Cotton College and gold medalist in MA in Anthropology from Guwahati University. She has received several academic awards as well as UGC GRF, ICSSR Postdoctoral Initiation Award and IIA's Associateship. She is a member of several advisory and governing bodies of government and private colleges in Meghalaya. She is also a member of editorial boards of several reputed national and international journals. Dr. Marak has written two books and edited three books, over 50 research papers in peer-reviewed journals and over 30 chapters in edited volumes. She has completed seven research projects funded by national agencies. She currently works as associate professor in the Department of Anthropology, Northeastern Hill University of Shillong, Meghalaya. Today, she is going to speak on early agriculture in Garo Hills, clues from ethnography. The abstract of this talk is also available on our website. We request you to please go and check there. As usual, other than the speaker, all of us will be on mute and we request you to not to take any recording or screenshots, please. And before I hand over the screen to Dr. Marak, I request you to all go and check our YouTube channel. The link you can find in the chat box. And as you can see, we have already started uploading many videos of the Down and Central's forum from the 2020s. So with this, I will stop sharing my screen. And I request Dr. Marak to take over. Dr. Marak, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Parabita Bose. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak on this particular platform, uh, the Herd and Harvest series, a very, very interesting, uh, you know, series, I must say, very, very interestingly titled uh, for the Sharma Heritage, uh, for the Sharma Center for uh, Heritage Education India, one of the centers which is doing exceptionally well in India and very, very popular uh, at the moment. I am extremely happy to be here in your midst to talk about uh, some of the works that I have been doing over the years, over a couple of decades, I must say, because even though I'm an anthropologist with specialization in prehistoric archaeology, I move on from both ethnography to archaeology, you know, and uh, basically I try to uh, find out answers to certain questions which uh, plague us uh, as we continue doing our research. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the topic of my presentation today, and let me share the screen here, is titled Early Agriculture in Garo Hills. This particular location that I talk about is Garo Hills, which is a part of Northeast India, is, uh, you know, uh, uh, an area which has been uh, highly studied, debated, so to say, because this in a way forms a corridor between the Indian Peninsula and Southeast Asia. 
So therefore, you know, this area is seen as a kind of a corridor in the past for prehistoric migration, population migration in the past. And also because uh, this location is a part of the Eastern Himalayas, a location which many scholars have said could have been uh, the, the, the place where uh, rice cultivation originated in the past. And that is why it becomes so much more interesting to study this location, um, the Garo Hills situated in Northeast India. Now, uh, of course, uh, when we talk about reconstructing the past of Garo Hills, then of course we do have certain lacunas here. We have not found any, um, you know, any evidence of uh, domesticated rice in archaeological context or of any other crops in archaeological context. We did not find ecofax, we did not find paleontological remains. Of course, that is not to say that there is some kind of a shortcoming in terms of research because we have had quite a, a good crop of researchers working in this location, including some very, very interesting findings, no doubt. But uh, of course, that could also be because of the unique location that we have here, uh, because of reasons connected to environment, the soil, or uh, climatic conditions, so on and so forth. Now, in this scenario today, I will be looking at ethnographic clues in order to uh, answer some questions connected to early agriculture. I'll try to see whether it is possible, firstly, to find out which might have been the cultivate, which might have been the crops to have been cultivated for the first time in this location, number one. Number two, uh, how did cultivation actually begin here? And number three, in what manner were the Neolithic tools, you know, used? I talk about the Neolithic tools because all of us know that that is how we correlate early agriculture basically coming during the Neolithic period. But of course, um, it will also be, uh, you know, uh, lacking on my part if I if I'm going to be talking about ethnography, but not speak about who the people who live in these particular locations are. So the major population that uh, we have here living in the Garo Hills region are a tribal community known as, known as the Garos. But of course, we do have other smaller communities like the Hajongs, the Rabha, the Koch. I mean, uh, there are so many other smaller communities like that. Uh, what is of great interest here uh, for anthropologists is that the Garos, including the other minor communities who live surrounding them, have a very unique system of, uh, you know, socio-cultural system, that of matrilineal. And in fact, the Garos are supposed to be one of the last living matrilineal people, you know, in the world. And uh, of course, the other communities like the Rabhas and the Koch who live in their vicinity or around them also show traces of matrilineal. So that is that also becomes very, very interesting. And in terms of adaptational process, we realize that these are a group of people who have a very simple, you know, uh, like uh, kind of um, adaptation to the to the ecology, so to say. And they normally live a hand to mouth um, existence. And uh, as you can see in the picture in front of you, they are majorly shifting cultivators here. And as I go on, I'll be talking about other features uh, as I go on with this particular talk. Now, uh, as a background, uh, this location, um, you know, that is marked in the map here is where the Garo Hills is situation, situated. And you can see that it falls in the western part of the state of Meghalaya. So therefore, it's the, it, it, you know, kind of uh, covers the western escarpment of the Meghalayan plateau, so to say. And this is a location uh, from where we have had reports of uh, stone tools uh, since the 1960s. And why do I say 1960s? Because that is when we had the Department of Anthropology, which was, you know, taking roots in um, the Guwahati University, where they regularly, the teachers of that particular department regularly went on explorations in different parts of Garo Hills and they had uncovered many of the sites there. And uh, if I'm talking about some of the early workers here, then of course I should also take some of the names there. So some of the uh, scholars who have done um, a lot of work in terms of uncovering many of the sites include uh, scholars like H.C. Sharma, Minerva Sonowal. Then we have um, 
Oh, before that, I have to talk about, obviously, the teacher that was T.C. Sharma. So T.C. Sharma is uh, one of the earliest, um, you know, scholars to have worked in this area. So we have T.C. Sharma, we have H.C. Sharma, we have S.K. Roy, D.K. Medhi, A. Abdullah Ali Ashraf, and so many others. Of course, the first uh, scholarly paper just come out of this reason was uh, the work that was done by M.C. Goswami and E.C. Bhagavati. Uh, when they un uncovered this particular site called uh, Rengsangri in Garo Hills. And that was the first scholarly article that came out of this particular reason. Now we have over uh, 45 sites which have been found in Garo Hills. But then uh, this 45 sites that we're talking about are also a little bit you know, difficult to pinpoint because uh, these sites um, show a lot of overlap and they are contiguous sites, you know, they uh, are near each other. And the uh, majority of the work that was done here uh, in the beginning uh, was focused on a type of technological approach. And, uh, you know, it, it's very interesting because we have such a huge crop of PhD thesis work which has actually been done on this location. And uh, if I may name out some of these theses, we have the first thesis to come out of this particular location was by H.C. Sharma way back in 1972. Then we have Minerva Sonowal's work in 1987. Then we have H.C. Mahanta. Then we have D.K. Mehdi who had done an, a kind of a, a geomorphological uh, study there. Then we have S.K. Roy who had uh, studied the Neolithic pottery of Garo Hills and compared it with uh, the pottery of other locations. Then we have Ashraf, who had uh, done a kind of a technometric analysis on the stone tools recovered from Garo Hills versus those from Kasi Hills. Then we have Ash Sharma. Then uh, in the newer, a lot of scholars, we have Gangotri Bhuya, we have Smita Devi Bora. We also have a very interesting work by Rita Deka. So, uh, you know, when we look at this whole crop of PhD thesis work and so many articles which has been written on this location, it makes us wonder as to how and why we have not actually been able to give a proper background to how and in what manner prehistoric people lived in this location. But as we go forward, that will also become clear why. Now, uh, interestingly, again, um, you know, I mentioned that we have around 45 odd sites. Now, interestingly, out of these 45 odd sites, we find a mention, specific mention of <clears throat> typical Neolithic tools from 38 of them. When I say typical Neolithic tools, I talk about something like this, where the authors themselves mention that these tools belong to the Neolithic period, or they specifically mention that these are axes and edges belonging to the Neolithic period or grinding stones, so on and so forth. Now, uh, some of the important sites that we have here are the ones that are, play, that are shown in the cranial. We have sites like Bibragri, which is supposed to be, and uh, which has been accepted by many authors as a typical Oabinian homeland. And just a few kilometers from uh, Bibragri is the site where we had done an extensive exploration that was Misimagri, which uh, is a Neolithic site. So, you know, uh, these sites are very, very near each other. And that is why we talk about contiguity, about which I'll again be showing in a bit. Uh, okay, one other aspect that I need to mention here is all the tools, all the uh, archaeological photographs that you see here today and all the ethnographic photographs that you will be seeing here today are all original. These are all pictures that have been <clears throat> collected by myself or my team members. And then, uh, yes, this is what I mean by how, how close these sites are located. So uh, this is the village of Mishimagri. And um, when we look at the site of MSG 7, so surrounding that, you know, uh, at an approximate radius of one to one, uh, one to 1.5 kilometers, we have over 12 sites. So this is how close these sites are that we are talking about. Now, again, when we, <clears throat> out of these 45 pot sites that I mentioned some time back, seven of these sites talk about uh, pottery finds. And uh, what is interesting about these pottery finds is these have been found in association with Neolithic tools. So therefore, all the authors, whoever, have, has, whoever has mentioned about these pottery finds, talk about <clears throat> how these pottery are actually essentially Neolithic in nature. Now, <clears throat> trying to, um, you know, uh, answer which crops might have been first cultivated, 
I would like to briefly dwell on roots and tubers and wild fruits. Garos and other tribal groups living in this uh, location, that is the Garo Hills region that we're talking about, have a large repertoire of roots and tubers that they consume. And in my own study on indigenous crops, which I had undertaken some years ago, I found 72 types of roots and tubers that they consume today or which they consumed once upon a time, meaning it is no longer found, but then it is there in their memory. And uh, when we look at these roots and tubers and the names which are there against them, their indigeneity comes out very strongly, meaning, um, for instance, if you look at the names like Ta'amande, Ta'tungbate, Ta'amache, all of these are vernacular terms for these uh, roots and tubers. And uh, this, in a way, indirectly shows the indigeneity of these roots and uh, crops. Again, when I talk about these root crops, then one thing I need to mention here is that some of these root crops are cultivated, but some are wild and some are semi-wild. And uh, in terms of, uh, you know, which uh, crops would they prefer, given a choice, they would prefer the root crops which are still found in the wild, because those are much more lesser, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, how often can you get them, you get them in a very, very less degree, so that is why the root crops which are in the wild are much more in demand. Now, if I talk about indigeneity of crops on the basis of linguistic, you know, or, uh, on the basis of terms, then one of the biggest examples that we have is the potato. The most popular root crop here in Garo Hills today is the potato, the potato which you and I consume, and uh, in the Indian context, uh, which is known as alu, right? And uh, here also it is majorly grown. So that is one of the most commonly and widely grown root crop today in Garo Hills. But this potato is also known as alu, so that also underlie, underscores the fact that the alu or the potato is actually something which is not indigenous, it is something which has come from outside. So therefore, linguistics to a large extent sometimes gives us clues as to how and where uh, the origin of some of these root crops or any other crops for that matter might lie. Now, uh, if we look at clues from folklore, then again, we find that, you know, in terms of origin myths, folk tales, and even folk songs, many of these uh, talk about roots and tubers. In fact, uh, in the different variants of the origin of paddy, which is the most important crop for them, we find that uh, they mention, I'll be talking about the origin of paddy in a bit from, uh, you know, from folklore, but then uh, they talk about how the garos before paddy was introduced to them subsisted on roots and tubers. I mean, that is how the stories go. In whichever variant of the story that you look at, that is how they talk about how the garos first subsisted on roots and tubers, and then they, you know, uh, they got this very important crop paddy. And uh, they also talk uh, majorly about uh, wild fruits, not fruits which are grown today, but then wild fruits. And uh, this particular picture that you see in front of you is a fruit known as Arwak or Boldurak, which majorly appears in uh, many of the folk tales. And this particular fruit is no longer consumed today, but it is um, looked upon as monkey food or bird food. This is a uh, gongman tree, a tuber that is, uh, you know, um, that is dying out, that is almost like an endangered crop. And um, this is a semi-wild variety. And uh, I say that this is more or less like dying out and endangered because many people of our generation actually has, have not even come across it. They do not know about it. They have not even eaten it. And this is supposed to have a medicinal value. Now, if we are to look at archaeological clues, then in the context of Garo Hills, we get a large number of stone tools. You know, uh, it also makes us realize because of so much of work, you know, so, so much of voluminous papers that have been written on different sites and the finds which we have uh, and the different artifactual evidence found there. It is clear that we have got thousands and thousands of stone tools of this particular from this particular location. And all of these tools definitely might have been could have been used for digging our roots and tubers. But the picture that you see in front of you are uh, what we refer to as picks. These are heavy duty 
um, you know, diggers, which can uh, do heavy duty digging of roots and tubers. And again, if I go back, these pictures are from our test excavation of Mishima Green 2017 that we had undertaken. And, um, you know, from the, uh, in the, in the, in the 45 odd sites that I mentioned some time back, we get specific mention of pics like this from five sites. So this is something which is also very, very commonly found. Now, if we are to look for clues uh, for early agriculture in the archaeological context in Garo Hills, then what are we supposed to look at? Firstly, we do not find any evidence of crops. We do not find any seeds. We do not find any pollen grains. Secondly, we do not find any paleo irrigation channels. We have seen paleo channels, but those were natural. We have not seen uh, intentional diversion of uh, channels in the past. And of course, if you look at ethnographic present, then we realize that these groups of people actually do not use any, they do not use any ir irrigational methods in order to, you know, divert the course of water. In fact, they are, uh, you know, they are so much uh, dependent on uh, the, 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 the natural sources of water or nutrients or whatever you call it. In fact, uh, they have a very, um, they have a tremendous sense of uh, which crop would grow well where because of the kind of soil which is there. And also depending on the availability of water, they would be growing certain crops in a particular location and some other crops in another location. Therefore, indigenous crops uh, possibly were grown on better grain soils between the channel banks in the past. Now from roots and tubers, let me go to the most important crop and that is uh, rice, which is a staple crop of uh, not only the Garus, but of so many other communities who live in this location. And uh, they grow uh, different varieties of rice. And uh, in another project that I had done, uh, I had uh, collected 107 varieties of rice from three different villages. Not all of them were cultivated. Some of them were cultivated and some of them had become endangered. Uh, the rice varieties that they grow, you know, in terms of color, you have black and red and uh, white and also brown varieties. Colors matter to some extent, but more than color, it was texture, the glutinous nature, aroma, and also how much of starch there was. The more starch there was, they considered it better because that was much more filling for them. This picture that you see in front of you is again hill paddy or paddy that is grown on the hills in a June field. And you can see that, uh, you know, not just paddy, but then so many other uh, crops are also nearby. The white leaf that you see on the side is actually ginger. Now, uh, they are traditionally uh, shifting cultivators, like I mentioned some time back, and then they follow this whole cycle of shifting cultivation that they do, which, is, which starts basically with selecting a particular plot. Shifting cultivators, as the name suggests, would refer to a kind of cultivation in which you shift the plot. And this shifting would take place, uh, you know, um, depending on which location you're living, sometimes uh, after two years or sometimes after three years, sometimes after five years, this particular plot will shift to different locations. So here, uh, first uh, step towards this kind of cultivation would be selecting a plot of land and thereafter you would be cutting down all the shrubs and undergrowths which are there and then you would be setting fire to it. Once um, the undergrowth has been set fire, then uh, from the very next day onwards, there would be uh, different crops which would be sown there. In this picture in front of you, you see a gentleman uh, sowing paddy, paddy grains with the help of a digging stick. So he's dibbling the soil, making a small hole there, and he's inserting a paddy seed there. Thereafter, as and when the crops ripen, then they would be harvesting all of these crops. And of course, uh, uh, you know, they would be having many rituals in between, but uh, that is how the whole cycle would happen. Sometimes in the second year's plot, they will continue the process. If it is a new, a new plot that they would be going to, then again, you know, selection of the plot of land will again take place. Now, uh, even though rice is the most important crop, uh, we understand that um, uh, shifting cultivation is actually a multi-crop uh, pattern that is followed here. 
Where in this picture, you can see paddy saplings growing together with maize. You can also see pumpkin and far away, you can also see tapioca there. So this is a multi-crop uh, cultivation way, which takes place, which actually to a large extent uh, leads towards, uh, you know, uh, what we refer to as sustainable agriculture because we have so many other crops growing at the same time. Right. Now, uh, if we look at uh, what folklore tells us, then it is said, as I mentioned some time back, that the first grains of uh, rice was gifted or given to the Garos by a deity known as Saljong. But how did Saljong get it? Uh, you know, um, there are many variants of this tale, but the basic story is the same. So it seems there was um, there was a tree, you know, there was a celestial tree, and the celestial reasons between in between the worlds. So the world of the deities and the world of human beings. So in between these two worlds, there was the celestial tree. So the deities would look at the tree, and uh, you know, it would look as if uh, the people living below could, uh, you know, um, could touch it. And then the people living below would also feel the same, you know, so it was in some kind of a no man's land where neither the deities nor the human beings could reach it. But what was interesting about this particular tree was that on this tree grew several branches and then on these branches were all this very, very beautifully colored rice. So there was golden rice, there was yellow, green, blue, you know, all different colored rice was there. And the deities would look down at it and they would want it. The human beings would be sitting down below and they would be wanting it, but nobody could reach it. So then uh, there were these deities of thunder and uh, lightning and rain. So they collaborated. So this is the first collaboration that appears in Garo folklore. So these three deities, they collaborated and they shook this particular tree, the celestial tree, which was there. And then some rice grains fell down. But these deities, after they shook the tree and after the grains uh, fell down, you know, they, um, they uh, start, uh, they kind of procrastinated. So they were having a leisurely life and they forgot about the grains. This is when a bird known as Doamak, the bird Doamak appears again very, very strongly in Garo folklore. And this is a bird which actually exists. And this is a bird that you see chirping all over the shifting uh, plots in Garo hills. Actually, the, the Doamak bird in, uh, I think the English um, name for that bird is the wren, W-R-E-N. So this particular bird saw the seeds lying on the ground and then it picked it up and planted in its spoon. Um, the Doamak is referred to as a she in Garo folklore. So she picked it up and then she sowed it in her own lands. So from uh, this particular plant which was growing and the seeds were growing and this bird Doamak was having you know, was eating those seeds and all that Sal Jong, which is another deity. So that deity saw that particular plant and wanted to have possession of that particular plant. So then there is another whole lot of story as to how, how uh, Sal Jong gets possession of that particular plant. But once Sal Jong got possession of that, land, of that plant, uh, he became uh, the most powerful deity and uh, he, uh, you know, became the possessor of all uh, wealth. But then again, one fine day, it's in Saljong, but he, he also became a very benevolent deity. So one day he saw a Garo, uh, you know, man sitting very, very dejectedly because he was so hungry. And uh, in his conversations with his Garo man, he came to know that his Garo man was eating only roots and tubers. And then in a conversation, how do you take out the roots and tubers? So this man said, can I use a stone to take out roots and tubers? So feeling bad for him, he, you know, shared some of the rice grains with him. But with the understanding that uh, in return, the Garo man had to do something. So there was a, some kind of a covenant that was made between the deity and a Garo person, you know, for the first grains that he had got. But what is interesting about the story is that not only was Saljong the person to have gifted the rice grains, but also Saljong is supposed to have been the person who taught the Garos how to do shifting cultivation. So that also becomes interesting in the situation. So understandably, for a people who majorly depended on natural resources of water and nutrients and um, therefore, there is a large number of rituals that they conduct annually according to the agricultural cycle. So there would be rituals in order to get permission to, you know, till a particular plot of land or there would be certain rituals connected to the paddy soul. So in fact, um, paddy or uh, rice has a spirit. So in order to propitiate that particular spirit, 
uh, there would be many rituals, so on and so forth. In fact, um, their cultural behavior throughout the year, you know, uh, irrespective of whether you're in the agricultural field or outside agricultural field would depend on these rituals. So there are many do's and don'ts, there are many taboos, there are many prescriptions, proscriptions, all connected to uh, the propitiation of these different spirits which are there. And um, you get the logic as to why they're doing it if you look at folklore there. Now, what about uh, if you look at it from the archaeological context? Uh, like I mentioned some time back, we, got, we get reports of Neolithic tools from 18, uh, from sorry, from 38 different sites out of 45. But the question is, could these have been used in early agriculture? Now, as a result of ethno-archaeological studies, it is clear that the Neolithic people of Garo Hill show remarkable resemblance to the present occupants of the region. Shankar Roy, in uh, one of his very interesting paper in 1981, stated that a comparative study of agricultural implements from a Neolithic and ethnographic context, that is the shifting cultivator Garos, revealed a homogeneity in function. The constraints the people of this area face today appear to be more or less the same for the Neolithic people as well. Therefore, he states that the present day people, and I quote, are modern, but economically Neolithic. So that is what he had said. In 2005, I, had, I tried to reconstruct, you know, the past economy in terms of the implements that were found in archaeological context, compare it with the ones uh, in a modern day context. Modern day context implements in Gary is also very simple. They use the iron hoe or the iron spade. Spade is a later introduction. Initially, they had used only the iron hoe, which is very small, which uh, you will see in a bit from now. In this, uh, you know, this particular experiment, which was conducted, of course, I realized much, much later. And now when I look at it, that it had many limitations, which perhaps I did not realize at the time. But now when I look back, I realize that there were many limitations there. But this particular experiment proved beyond doubt that parallels can be drawn between the past and present in the context of uh, Garo Hills. So uh, how were these tools used now, whatever tools that we're finding, uh, that we find in Garo Hills? As I mentioned some time back, we have a large repertoire of stone tools, which comes from Garo Hills, different types, uh, you know, showing different characteristics, so on and so forth. But uh, for this uh, presentation today, I pick up three important tools or slash artifacts, whatever you call it. And uh, however, in this picture, as you can see on the right hand side, you see a lady digging, uh, making a small hole with the hoe, the iron hoe that I mentioned. So these are the kind of implements they use today. She's making a small hole there and she's trying to, uh, she's, she's going to be planting the, uh, the ginger rhizome there, right? So that is why she is digging. So, you know, for uh, three to five centimeters, you can just go very easily with the iron hole. On the other hand, on the left hand, left hand side, when you see then for sowing paddy, for sowing paddy grains, uh, in a first year's plot, very uh, often they still use the digging stick. So you use a digging stick, make a small uh, hole there, and then you insert the paddy grains there. Uh, so essentially, this is the kind of cultivation process which is still underway in Garo Hills. So the first tool that I talk about is the short axe. So from the discussion of the first crops in the state ecology, which I state as roots and tubers, I briefly dwell, I would like to briefly dwell on this whole dilemma of the short axe, which is otherwise seen to be a very typical Hoabinian tool. And out of the 45 sites, authors have mentioned the term Hoabinian uh, in 10 different sites. But did the Hoabinian actually, uh, is the Hoabinian actually present in the context of Garo Hills? Now, in order to answer that, I have to, uh, you know, cite the work by H.C. Sharma, uh, wherein he talked about uh, an excavation which they had done in Rongram, in the site of Rongram, and there he talks about how there was, a, uh, there was the Hoabinian layer underlying the Neolithic. So that was a stratified site. And uh, it is also true that uh, some of the locations like Bibragri that I mentioned some time back, it uh, appears to be a Hoabinian homeland because of the kind of tools which are found there. In terms of ecological adaptation, Northeast India is very similar to Southeast Asia. 
And since there is already a shared landmass, it is highly likely that a Hoa Binin existed quite extensively in the reason here. It also gives credence to the whole theory of roots and tubers probably being one of the first crops you know, to be grown in the reason. In this connection, uh, uh, you know, we, I also ask about the specificity of the short axis in Garo Hills. Uh, there are divergent opinions about the short X across the world, of course, and it majorly revolves around two issues. First is whether they are Sumatra lids, that means whether they are uh, unifacially prepared and whether they are accidentally broken. Now, uh, you know, many authors have said that they are indeed Sumatra leads. They also talk about it as half Sumatra lead because it is uh, shortened, right? So they talk about it's half Sumatra lead. And many others also say that they were actually accidentally broken. But if they were accidentally broken, then it makes us wonder as to what kind of logic was there where so many of these tools were accidentally broken again and again and again and again, right? And in the context of Garo Hills, when you look at it, we realize that these tools, uh, which we are calling a short X, they are um, both unifacially and bifacially flaked. Meaning we do find some tools which are unifacially flaked. So we find a cortex on the other side and um, some of them, uh, many of them are bifacially flaked. Of course, the difference being only in the degree to which flaking has been done. Now, whether they're accidentally broken, we realize that here there is a clear cut truncation. A truncation is there, which negates the fact that they were actually accidentally broken. So they do not appear to be like accidentally broken. They appear to be intentionally broken in the context of Garo Hills. This picture that you see in front of you is from one of my publications on short axis wherein I talk about how the short X is actually a very, very discreet type in the Garo Hills toolkit. And uh, how all the short X that we have in our possession, I say in our possession because I will not be able to talk about short axes which other authors have worked on, but the short axis which is in our position, possession, it normally follows three different types that we that is there in front of you and it is the picture is self-explanatory. The last one, of course, is uh, more rather than being a short X, it is more like a lanceolate tip or butt. It's like a broken lanceolate tip or butt. But again, what is very interesting is the truncation. If you look at the truncation, it is almost like 90 degrees. So that becomes very, very interesting again. Now, uh, when we look at um, edge angle measurements, uh, roughly we have uh, 40 to 65 degrees. Um, that is how the, um, uh, the edge angle is. And to a large extent, that indicates that possibly the, um, you know, the purpose for which it was used is whittling, besides many other purposes, of course. Now, when we talk about whittling, then it is likely that a short axis uh, might have been used, some of the short axis at least, might have been used as TMTs, tool making tools, in order to give shape to some other things like, for instance, uh, you know, bamboo or wood, which is found so strongly and so much in this particular location, perhaps, they were used as TMTs to make to give shape to those. When we look at unit distributions, we realize the majority of these short axes might have been, the work might have been light to medium, even though we have some of these very, very huge short axes where the unit distribution is uh, very big. Uh, from this particular talk, I mean, uh, discussion on the short X, I next go to the next tool, uh, which is uh, the cells. Uh, here I talk about as I have, you know, kind of tackled as a chipped and ground cells, mainly because even though Neolithic tools are basically ground and polished tools, in our own work we have not come across any polished tools, and very rarely have you come across ground tools. Majority of the tools uh, that we have are chipped or chipped and ground. Um, Tishi Sharma, way back in 1981, had talked about the Neolithic cells as uh, he had categorized them as flat cells and shouldered cells, which is self-explanatory. On the basis of technology, we find tools which are either chipped or chipped and ground, which is the major category that we find here, fully ground and polished. In our own work, we have not found any polished tools and fully ground tools. Rita Decca, in a very interesting work, you know, that her PhD thesis dealt basically with the Neolithic tools of uh, the whole of Northeast India, but then while talking about the Neolithic tools of Garo Hill, she talks about how the Nar Garo Hill's uh, Neolithic toolkit can be divided into edge and X, sho shouldered cell, chisel, scraper, and very interestingly TMT. 
But of course, hard TNT uh, mainly talks about uh, the Neolithic, uh, you know, whatever tool was found, which was used as an abrader and not the TMT that I am talking about right now. But then that's a very interesting find that she had found. Now, in this context, um, the extensive presence of wooded forest, you know, when I, wooded forest, no doubt, but the forest is actually forest made out of bamboo. So maybe I should be saying bamboo forest that is found in Garo Hills is very, very interesting and it cannot be overlooked. And it is highly likely that the short axis, which I mentioned some time back, and many of these cells of the Neolithic period, of course, they were definitely used for many other purposes. But some of them might have been used for, you know, giving shape to, uh, you know, wood and bamboo implements. In this context, I want to refer to one of uh, the articles that Ashraf had written. Um, I think it was in 2004. And he had uh, mentioned that when you compare the toolkits of Garo Hills and Kasi Hills, Garo Hills, mind you, is on the western side of the Meghalaya Plateau and Kasi Hills is on the eastern side. So when you compare the toolkits of these two uh, areas, Ashraf had talked about how in a Kasi Hills toolkit, you find a large number of the pointed tools of the pointed category, and you, are, you do not find that in the Garo Hills tool category. Now pointed tools meaning tools which could have been used as a projectile weapon. And for that, he suggests looking at parallels in ethnographic present. So what happens when we look at ethnographic present? Kasis, uh, we do not know what happened in the past, but then Kasis uh, have, um, you know, this very, very strong affinity towards um, the, the bow and arrow. It appears very strongly, not only in the folk tale, but even in their present day lives. In fact, uh, traditional archery, traditional competitions, you know, in fact, archery is seen to be a traditional sport and a traditional competition you know, uh, still continues on archery for the Kasis even today. On the other hand, when we look at the Garos, the, uh, you know, the archery or the bow and arrow doesn't even appear. And uh, even though they use spears, but then those spears are not made of iron head, uh, iron, I mean spear head made of iron, but those are basically spears which are made out of wood and bamboo. Of course, they use also a large number of traps, you know, made out of bamboo in their hunting processes. So it is very likely that, uh, you know, majority of the toolkit, which is there in the Garo Hills context, would have been those which are based on uh, wood and bamboo. And many of these tools that we are talking about today might have been used in order to uh, give shape to these. The third artifact that I would like to refer to today are the pot shirts. And though not found abundantly as stone tools, a few broken pieces of pottery have been reported from these sites, Chitra Abri, Ganol, Greek, Awak Abri, so on and so forth. And the picture that you see in front of you is um, two pieces of pot shirts that we had found from our um, chest excavation, uh, showing a part of the ring there. And um, it is clear that pottery found in Garo Hills is handmade and coarse, and it has no slip, except the one in, a, in an article reported by Sharma and Singh. And it has no varnish and it has no decoration. In fact, the court impressed wear, which is taken to be a marker of Neolithic in Northeast India, is missing here. From Gawak Abri, very recently, Sharma and Singh had got a OSL date of approximately 2000 years ago, indicating that the Neolithic people lived around that time. From Ishimagri, the area where we worked on, we got an approximate date of 1,000 years. But what is very, very interesting is a site of bamboo tea, uh, which was worked upon by Ashraf and his student, uh, Anamika Duora. And uh, there, an OSL date of approximately 3,000 years was found. But uh, this site of bamboo tea, um, you know, a large number of Neolithic cells were found, a large number of pot shirts were found, and these pot shirts which were found there were handmade coarse grey ware, and also intrusion of iron was found there. And, uh, you know, when we, uh, when we try to see whether cord impressed ware can be taken as a marker of Neolithic in Northeast India, all these examples that we have starting with bamboo tea, because their extensive work has been done, you realize that cord impressed ware is not just, cannot, cannot be taken as the only marker of Neolithic in Northeast India. And there were many localized traditions which happened 
In fact, in the context of Garu Hills, if you take cue from Bambuti uh, pottery, we realize that here in Garu Hills too, there was a localized tradition. There was a gray or red ware with no designs and no cord marks. And the pot shirts, which we had mentioned in table two some time back, have been found in excavations in context or in association with Neolithic, and therefore they are undoubtedly Neolithic of Neolithic origin. And it is also, however, likely that the people might have used non-ceramic and organic materials for storing and cooking, such as dry goats and bamboo stems, much like the present Igaros, for storing water or seeds or beer, as well as for cooking, uh, as it is done in the Southeast Asian, um, you know, Hoabinian homeland. Now, uh, if we look at uh, the ethnographic context, we realize that pottery is still made by a handful of people, but uh, they use very, very simple tools to make pottery. And this insect picture that you see here are old pots which are used as mold. So in the Garyals context, pottery that is made is the mold method. Now, uh, Again, uh, like I mentioned some time back, very, very, uh, they use very, very uh, simple tools to make pottery and their pottery is, uh, you know, it follows some kind of a pattern like this, as you can see. Um, first is uh, collecting the clay. And here again, um, collection of, when we talk about collection of clay, you know, there is this location called Siju, as a place called Siju in East Garo Hills. Uh, which uh, from which all the spotters that that I have interacted with um, have been collecting the soil from the clay from you know they, uh, they say that they had, they had experimented from uh, from different sites different locations but then they always go back to Siju and also in many of the case studies that we have taken there the origin is always Siju and that is why I refer to Siju as the uh, nuclear area of pottery uh, of pottery in Garo Hills. So they say that from uh, they collect the um, the clay from underneath the soil. So we are not talking about just you know five centimeters, ten centimeters underneath the soil. We're talking about rat hole mining, basically something like that, which takes place there. In fact, there's a very interesting story, which says that uh, you know in uh, Seju, a group of women. Okay, I have to mention that here in Garo Hills, pottery uh, or the pots that are made are made by women, not by men. So a group of women had gone down to dig out. Uh, this soil is called Adhika. So they had gone to dig out Adhika soil in order to make pot. So uh, like I mentioned some time back, it's almost like a rat hole mining. So then they, they went inside deep into the earth. And as they were going inside, then the mouth of the, uh, the entry through which they had entered, it was blocked by a large stone. So they could not come out. So when they could not come out, they started shouting and calling out the husband so-and-so, you know, please come and save us and all that. And the husbands and all the village people, they came, they looked at the large stone which covered that particular hole. They looked at it, they talked among themselves and they shouted back saying, you don't worry about us, we are fine. And then they went back. This sounds very hilarious for somebody like us. And then if I am to, you know, kind of analyze it more and I might even think how, what rubbish, oh, I mean, what kind of husbands that did not even save their wives and so on and so forth. But then uh, when we look at the scenario and when we try to understand, then these are a group of people who live majorly on, um, on, on nature, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and on science of nature. So they depend a lot on that. So therefore, it, if, you, if we are to, you know, kind of analyze this situation, then it looks like as if, uh, the people in the village, they saw it as a sign of the deities, you know, uh, something had gone wrong because there's so many do's and don'ts, so many prescriptions and proscriptions that you have to do that you cannot do. So it, they looked at it as a sign from the deities, something had gone wrong, that these women had done something wrong. So they were taken by the deity, you know, that kind of stuff. Anyway, so first they collect the soil, the, the, the clay that we're talking about, and it is uh, left in the sun to dry out, then these granules are then pounded in a mortar, then it is sieved so that you get fine powder, then it is kneaded with water, you know, to have a very, very fine paste. Oh, here again, I have to mention that in the pottery of Garo Hills, you do not find the use of any tempering material. So there is no tempering material here at all. In fact, they strongly believe that if you use any other material as a tempering material, then it is going to burst and it's going to, you know, uh, the pot is going to burst. Then they knead it and then they spread it out on a mat or on a, 
you know, kind of a, uh, on some kind of a seed, they spread it out, sorry, and then uh, they, they use a mold method, so then they put it on there, and then they, you know, kind of smoothen it out, and they put it out in the sun for some time. When it is in a, in a kind of a, a semi-hard condition, then they, against number nine, you can see that they start the beating process. So they, they take a large a piece of stone, and then they use a beater and then they beat it so that there is a thin wall all around. And if you wish to put in a neck, this is the time when you will be putting a neck. Again, they will put they will be drying it out in the sun. And then when it is in leather hard condition, then they would be polishing it against number 11, you can see. So this polishing actually is the you know uh, most strenuous job because you need to really polish it for a long time for it to get some kind of a shine there. Thereafter, it is smoked for some time. And then finally, uh, file in an open furnace. So this is essentially the process that you find there. Now, in the ethnographic context, again, um, uh, when I have done a systematic typological study, this particular picture that you see is from one of my articles. I surmised uh, that all color pottery is either one or the other traditional type. One or the other meaning of pots which have a neck and pots which do not have a neck. So I call it as an open mounted pot and a pot with a neck. So it's either one or the other. And all the other pots that you find there in the governance context are variants of either one or the other. In fact, the picture that you see on your left and right hand side is that of rice beer pots, which are known as chudka. And even though it looks like amphora, like an amphora, it is amphora shaped and we also refer to it as amphora shaped pot, but uh, it is actually a variant of the pot with the neck. And uh, this uh, particular pot looks like an amphora, uh, majorly because of the external uh, ornamentation which is there, which is basically, you know, uh, the, the cane um, uh, case which has been made for it. Now, um, like I mentioned, the, they are all variations of either one or the other, and it depends a lot on the size. So then depending on the size, how big it is, you have a different name. How small it is, you have a different name. And depending on the size, they have different functions as to why they're used, you know. So that also changes from the smallest to the biggest that you have here. So uh, when we look at the uh, pottery that we had got from the archaeological context, because we had got a ring there in two of them. So then when we try to, you know, kind of reconstruct, this is the shape that we get. And it is very clear that it shows a continuity with the ethnographic context the kind of pottery that is found today, you know, of the different types. So we can find parallels to that. Now, finally, I come to the most important question that is uh, whether, you know, hills to creek or creek to hills as to how did agriculture actually happen here, in what manner, uh, how did it proceed, okay? Now, uh, when I talk about the creek, I refer to this particular location. You can see that um, there is some kind of cultivation going on up in the hills. There's some cultivation down at the bottom of the hill also, right? And then um, this location at the bottom of the hill is what I refer to as a creek. By definition, if you look at what a creek is, you'll find that the dictionaries will tell you it is a narrow sheltered waterway, like an inlet. But when I define, when I talk about creek, then I'm defining it in a much more broader sense. I'm talking about those locations where there is some kind of a, um, some kind of a water inlet. So therefore it is very marshy and it is a very, uh, it's like a swampy marshy area. But of course, over generations, when you are cultivating there, then, you know, the swampiness or the marshiness reduces. But nevertheless, these are locations which in Garo uh, terminology is referred to as Art Dubek. So I'm referring to these locations, which are known as Atubek, which are as the creek. So a very interesting question was put forward by S.K. Roy in his 1980 publication, where he asked, did cultivation come from the top or from the bottom? You know, did cultivation come from the top to the bottom or from bottom to the top? So that is the question that he had asked. To this question, Ashraf has stated in a, you know, stated uh, in a personal communication that the culti cultivation actually went up from the creeks to the hills. And he cites the example of large axes and edges that are found in the bottom of the hills, especially in the creeks, where the and uh, while the size becomes much more smaller as you go up the hill. This is suggestive of what authors like S.K. Roy and S. Sharma stated in their articles that much of the Neolithic tools that are found in Garo Hills have been reworked on as it becomes blunt. 
And this is why Roy suggested the tools that are found are possibly much more smaller than the original. And I concur with this particular statement, mainly for two reasons. Firstly, because these are uh, swampy, damp areas where roots, tubers, and other crops, you know, which, uh, which requires a large amount of water, uh, you know, um, might be grown there. And secondly, on the basis of the archaeological materials found at the bottom of the hills versus at the top of the hills. But if cultivation went from below to up, you know, from uh, the creeks to the hills in the prehistoric context, then what has happened now? Now you can see that these areas which are referred to as creek, which were originally creeks, but then have now been converted into large paddy areas, right? Wet paddy, where wet paddy culti cultivation takes place. So, uh, you know, in this context, I would like to modify Asher's theory of creek to hills into creek to hills and back to creeks throughout the ages in Garo Hills. So in the prehistoric context, Ashra very rightly says that cultivation took place from the creeks to the hills. And in the historic period and throughout the ages in Garo Hills, I talk about how cultivation actually took place from creeks to hills and back to the creeks again. And I talk about this by taking cues from ethnography where the present occupants, the Garos, who invariably are Jum, were Jum cultivators and are Jum cultivators today also, Cultivating the hills is a multi-crop pattern that later adopted wet paddy in the creeks and valleys between the hills by learning the craft from another tribal population who lived in the area, that is the Hajongs. In fact, the name Hajong is said to have been given by the Garo to this tribal population who, were, who do paddy cultivation, wet paddy cultivation by using the plow. So uh, etymologically, the name Hajong means that comes from Aani Jong. Aa means land, Jong means warm. So Garos, it is said, were flabbergasted by this group of people who were tilling the, you know, the land like worms and very, very profusely. So they were so much enthused by that that they adopted it from them as well. So, um, you know, so finally, this is what I see, okay? So I'm talking about going a creek to hills and back to the creeks. So finally, in conclusion, what can we say about agriculture in Garo Hills? We do not find any food grains, we do not find any food residues in archaeological context at all. But taking clues from ethnography, some of the conjectures that we can make are, number one, just as in Southeast Asian sites, in Garo Hills too, the first crops to have been cultivated were probably root crops, due to its ease in terms of cultivation, starting from semi-cultivation that is in marshy, swampy areas. However, we also cannot negate the fact that we have a large number of wild grass, uh, wild rice grasses still found in the reason, which, which also could have been growing in the wilds only to be harvested and later domesticated. Secondly, the crops, whichever may it be, were likely grown in a marshy creeks, which is conducive for the growth. Thus, from this creeks cultivation likely moved up the hills, with chum cultivation appearing in the horizon. It is a way of life brought in by newer people or as acculturation from neighboring groups. Multiple crops began to be grown, including rice from here in the context of Garo Hills, again, moved back to the creeks, you know. Third, the Neolithic toolkit is very, very interesting. Not only does it encompass typical Neolithic tools, but also tools which are not typical ones. In our factory side of Mishimagri, we found not only, uh, you know, Neolithic tools like this, which are chipped and ground axes, but also we found a large number of other tools like short axes and uh, scrapers and blades and so on and so forth. Majority of them showing the chipping technique. And uh, this is why uh, when we look at the kind of uh, tools that we have found, it is likely that many of the tool, these tools might have been used as TMTs in order to give shape to the locally available uh, products which were there, you know, in order to use them as tools. Localization of cultures might have taken place for two reasons, uh, as adaptation to the immediate ecology and for purposes of specific functions. It is also likely that some amount of innovation actually did take place in conjunction with the environment in which they live. Fourth, not only are the prehistoric sites contiguous to present-day settlements, but continuity can be seen both in terms of tool typology and usage, as well as in pottery to the present. This is an indirect indication that possibly the prehistoric people of Garo Hills and the present occupants shared the same ideologies in terms of ecological adaptations, social cultural adjustments, if not the same genes. That is still a question mark. 
However, it is clear that the Neolithic pottery tradition not only shows a strong continuity, but it intrudes into the historic phase. And I leave you all today with this particular photograph, which was taken in 2017 as a part of another project. And this is the same opening photograph which was there in my presentation today. And here you will see not only, you know, semi-wild tuberous tubers growing in the same location. This is the area that I refer to as the creek. So here you not only find the semi-wild tubers growing today, but you also find um, hill paddy grown nearby. So, you know, in the same location that we're talking about, we have both this uh, tubers as well as the wild grains there. So I come to the end of my presentation today. Thank you very much for giving me a patient hearing. And if there are any comments, any questions, I would be very happy to take them. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. And really, really enjoyed listening to you speak as always and to hear all these points which you have published some and you brought them together so, uh, so effectively. It was really very fascinating. So what I'm going to do now, I'll hand you back to Dr. Paramita. Before that, I will stop the live stream on uh, YouTube so that